Well, just another normal morning around uh, Butcher Laboratories here in Spring Hill. By the way, I thought y'all would appreciate this. I, uh, most of y'all know this. I, uh, I have a one-man submarine, submersible, that I built back in the 90s. And uh, once in a while, I put it in parades. And uh, this is my German U-boat commander's hat, which uh, I wear when I'm in the parade. No, I'm not endorsing any philosophies here. I just thought it was a very neat hat to have. Uh, this is what they <clears throat> used when they were raiding the convoys during World War II. That's the uh, the white one. It was always the U-boat commander's hat. So, all right. Anyway, so much for the levity. Uh, it is Tuesday morning, and I've got a lecture prepared for you. As a matter of fact, I've, I've got about two of them prepared for you, and I think you will like these lectures. Uh, to start with, we're going to be jumping around a little bit. I'm going to show you different techniques. We're going to look at uh, different theorems. And then my plan is, once I basically introduce most, if not all, of what I want to cover with you, we'll go back and do some problems, some more problems, and kind of flesh out these techniques a little bit more. I'm not worried about getting out of this chapter right now because it's it's a very important foundational chapter. You need to know this information down the line. <clears throat> so anyway, um, we're going to be looking at some new theorems. And uh, I'm going to show you some mathematical techniques that you can use to solve these once you actually set up the equations for them. All right. Now, I have an announcement to make. I did send out an email to all of you. And uh, this is in regards to a Zoom meeting. And what I'd like to do is uh, I would like to have our first meeting. We may not have one of these every week, but I want to have the first meeting uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. I think that's going to work out for the majority. And I'm going to try to record these. I should be able to without any trouble. As Actually, I'm using Zoom software right now to record these lectures. And it works very, very well, even though I don't technically go online with Zoom while I'm doing this. I just use the software to do the recordings <clears throat> and then post the recordings to YouTube, as you well know. All right. So anyway, seven o'clock. What I'm going to do is look for your email and um, that night. And right before things get set up, I'm going to send out a, um, a URL or a link so that you can uh, enter it into Zoom. You might want to, if you've never used Zoom, you might want to try it and uh, learn a little bit about it, how to put the codes in and that type of thing. So we should have a pretty good meeting on Thursday. I don't think it's going to be real long. And I don't want to get bogged down working a whole lot of uh, arithmetic uh, operations with y'all. But what I'm going to try to do first is when you have a question on the, uh, on the problems, what I want to emphasizes is basically the technique that you go through to solve these, not necessarily working them all out to answers. The only answers that I have pertaining to what's in the book would be actually what's in the back of the book. Those are the only answers I have. Any other answer I have to tediously go through it and work it out. And uh, since I'm basically lazy, I, I don't work out all the problems that I assign you. So anyway, we'll we'll look at them and I'll, I'll show you some techniques and y'all can try them. And if you still have problems, we'll go a little bit more in depth with them. All right. Now, as I said, we're going to look at some new things. Um, <clears throat> when you start looking at circuits that have more than one source, in them, like more than one voltage source or more than one current source, that can be very daunting when it comes to trying to figure out a way to solve them. Not everything is a simple series or parallel or series parallel or parallel series circuit. Not everything falls into those categories. I showed you an example the other day with the Wheatstone Bridge. When you have an unbalanced bridge, and I hope not a lot of y'all are unbalanced, but anyway, uh, if you have an unbalanced bridge, that center resistor, taking that out makes the bridge easy to solve. But then it's... Uh, not of great effect to you in a lot of cases because, well, you really need to have that center resistor in there for certain advantages. Anyway, when you're looking at that kind of circuit, you put that resistor in there, it's unbalanced. You can't solve it with any of the techniques you have. Now, I did give you one technique 
where you actually do a delta to y transformation and then you can solve it. And that's just one technique in the toolbox. There are many. So we're going to look at some things today. Now, the first theorem that I'm going to look at with you is something called superposition. And superposition does not work with everything. Okay. It does work where you have linear components. So what do I mean by a linear component? If you have a component like a resistor, the amount of current in that resistor is directly proportional to the amount of voltage across it. So it's linear. It's reaction current wise is linear to the voltage. Now, if you have light bulbs, I'm not talking about LEDs, but LEDs would also fall into that category. But if you have light bulbs, say incandescent light bulbs with filaments, a filament of a light bulb has a resistance, yes. So if it's a 12 volt light bulb at 12 volts, it's going to be illuminated and it's going to have a certain amount of, of total resistance. If you operate that bulb at six volts, it may or may not produce a noticeable glow. It might be red. Uh, it might be kind of yellowish, not operating up to its full capacity. The filament won't be as hot as it would be under normal circumstances. And because it's not as hot due to the, uh, the thermal factors that, that regard resistivity, uh, it won't have the same resistance. It resist its resistance will be lower. So it is basically going to adjust its resistance as a function of current. And the current and the voltage are functions anyway. It gets kind of complicated. And what happens is you have basically a variable resistor there. And the amount of resistance is determined by the amount of current and or voltage that you have across it. That kind of component cannot be used in superposition where it's not linear. The, the VI curve is not linear. Volt uh, versus current or current versus voltage curve is not linear. So we have to exclude that. But resistors are a prime example of what you can use superposition with. Let me, uh, let me cut to my first share here and uh, I'll show you something. Okay, I, uh, last night I, I went through all of these. <clears throat> so I would have them already drawn out, save us a lot of time. This is a circuit right here that is sort of time honored for illustration purposes. I've never seen this circuit in any way, shape, form or fashion used in the real world, but it's a good uh, exercise. And by the way, we're gonna solve this circuit like three, three or four times using different techniques today and in the next lecture. I've created R1, R2, and R3, and here are the resistances. I'm powering this with a 10 volt battery here. Now remember, the book uses a different symbol here. I'm, I oftentimes switch them out, but whether it's a round circle with a positive and negative on it, or it's the battery symbol, it doesn't matter. It's a voltage source. So I've got V1 and V2. Now, under the rules of series, parallel, and combinations of those two, you cannot solve this. This is difficult to solve because you have two sources. You can't break this down very easily. But once again, these are resistive sources, so they're linear. We can use superposition on this. Now, let me explain what you do with superposition. What you do is you take n number of sources. It can be more than two. You can also have current sources uh, and voltage sources. You can have a combination, a mix, or you can have all current, all voltage. Doesn't matter. What you do with this circuit is you take out every source, current or voltage. You take it out and leave only one source. And then you work the currents and the voltages across the resistors in the network and you record them and then you put that source um, you remove that source your first source and put one of the other sources in so you only evaluate with one source at a time in so doing this circuit right here becomes a series parallel now when we say remove the source what are we talking about well if it is a voltage source and this is very important we have to remove it with a short if it is a current source, we take the current source out when we're removing it with an open circuit. In other words, we just, we just take it out. We don't, 
we don't solder the circuit back together. Okay, just leave it out for the time being. Now let's work this when it has two voltage sources. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to leave V1 in the circuit, but I'm going to replace V2 with a short. There's the short where V2 was. Now I'm going to make a note here, and we're going to talk about this later today. But with these sources that are removed, a battery, a generator, photovoltaic source, no matter what it is, it's going to have an internal resistance. And we're going to talk about that later on today. But for the time being, if it's a perfect battery or a perfect voltage source, the internal resistance of that would be zero. So we can replace it with this short. If this particular battery had an internal resistance of uh, 0.1 ohms, let's say, then to get the best result, we would replace the battery with a 0.1 ohm resistor. So in other words, it wouldn't be a perfect short. But if we're looking at ideal voltage sources as we are with this, you replace it with an ideal short because this is assumed to have no internal resistance. If that doesn't make sense, it should later on today, okay? Now, what I did here was I took this circuit, leaving just V1 in here, shorting out the other voltage source. So now I've got a one source circuit. Now, this should be fairly easy for you to solve now. What I do is I take 25 and 50, I do a combination on those two. That'd be like putting a big circle around all of that. And uh, I didn't write my numbers down, but when you do 50 and 25, you come out with an amount of resistance, which is in series with this 15 ohms. Then you find the total resistance. I did that in some of these others, but I didn't the first time. And then you find the current flowing through this resistor, uh, the current flowing through this resistor, and the same over here. Taking that current, you can multiply it by the resistance, and that gives you the voltage drop across this resistor. For example, this would be in this case, positive, and that would be negative, okay? And this would be positive, and that would be negative, and of course, this would be positive, and that would be negative. So we solve for all three current flows. You do not have to solve for the voltages, but I did it here just to illustrate what's going on. By the way, if y'all keep looking at my finger right here, I uh, had a little uh, milling machine accident. No, I didn't get it in the grinder. I was machining a piece of Delrin and it caught, spun around and knocked the daylights out of my hand um, several weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. Anyway, it's going to be okay. Y'all can watch it grow out. Now, once you get these numbers, once you get these numbers, you come down here and you do the same thing again. But this time you remove V1 and you reestablish V2. This is your original V2. Once again, these two are in parallel, so you make one resistance out of it. I did that, it's 9.375. I wanna add a note here. A lot of these, just to reduce rounding error, I do carry these out quite a bit. But when you think about these resistances, and they may be, you know, five ohms plus, or excuse me, 5% of the resistance value above or below what's stated, uh, carrying this thing out to four significant digits doesn't make a lot of sense. I, I kind of did that for illustration purposes. But in here, three is going to be more than enough for anything we're going to do in this course. Okay, so anyway, I combine these two resistors and find that the equivalent resistance is a little over nine ohms. And then over here, I've got 50. So when I add them together, this plus what's in the circle, that's 59.375 ohms. Well, that gives me an R total of what I just stated here. Then we divide this R total into 15 volts, Ohm's law, and find that we got a current flowing from right to left. That, by the way, would cause that to be positive and that to be negative. This would be positive, this would be negative, this would be positive, and this would be negative. So anyway, the, uh, the current flowing through this would be 0.2526 uh, amps or 256.6 milliamps flowing through R2. Then I use the current divider rule here. Remember, if you want to find the current in this resistor, it's this value divided by the sum of these two multiplied by the current entering 
the network here, which would be the 0.2526 amps. So I get a I get a current through this resistor R1, and I get a current through this resistor R2. Here's here's R2's current down here, and I went ahead and solved for the voltages, and they would be negative, positive, positive, negative, and uh, the voltages are written down here, and the current's written above it in amps. So I've got the effect of V1 on R1, R2, and R3, and I have an independent effect of V2 on R1, R2, and R3. They're just not in there at the same time. So what we do is we look at this almost like an overlay, where you have this information overlaid and this information overlaid on top of it. And the effects of each voltage source, now this is important, the effects of each voltage source is superimposed together. It's one superimposed on the other. So in other words, in this case, I've got a current to the right of 0 0.1053 amps. In this case, the same resistor with another voltage source has a current to the left, and I did put an error here, of 0.2526 amps. Which one wins out? Well, this one's bigger than that one. So the total current in reality here through this network, the total current would be the sum of the two. So uh, here is, uh, let's see, that would be R2. So I've done it down here. Current to the left is 0.2526. Current to the right is 0.1053. This current is bigger than that. So the final direction of the current is signified by my large arrow here. And it would be this value minus that value. In other words, they superimpose. Can current go two ways in a resistor at the same time? No, but, but when you superimpose, one will actually dominate the other almost always. And when it does, you just take the difference between the two. So you net them together and you get a current to the left of 0.1473. Now I did the same thing with R1 here. I have a current to the right from V1 of that. I've got a current to the left of that from V2. Add them together, the one to the right wins. So it's going to be this current minus this current, and you keep the error, the direction of the larger of the two currents. If you've got three sources, you'll be adding three currents here. So anyway, uh, here's the currents that I calculated. And then R3, uh, it has two currents, but they're in the same direction. In other words, this source is pushing it down through here. This source would be pushing it down through here. So these are in the same direction, and that's top to bottom. And you just simply add those together to get 0 0.3052. Now, here's something kind of interesting. I did this with currents, and normally it's done with currents. But if you use the voltages, let's look at R1. Up here, I have a voltage here, positive and negative. That voltage is 4.737 volts. Down here, that voltage is opposite in polarity. It's negative over here and positive over there. So that's opposite to the first consideration. So they're kind of in opposition to each other. And the voltage there is 2.369. So when you add voltages, I put a positive and a negative here. So this would be the orientation of R1's voltage due to V1. And this is the orientation and value of the voltage due to V2. You would say this voltage minus this voltage and keep the sign of the larger of the two voltages. Now I just did it for R1 and R2. Then I, well, I ran out of paper. Okay. So this is the way that is done. By the way, um, let me inject this idea. I have a scanner here and I'm going to scan these sheets and I will, uh, I'll make that available online. So you don't have to write down tremendous detail. I guess I should have told you that to begin with. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at a different example down here. And let's go back to the camera. Now this is a, uh, this is an example of mesh analysis, mesh analysis. Uh, this is a technique that is very powerful. It's one of a numerous set of techniques that you can use for solving uh, multiple source problems. Now, what I did was I took the exact same example that, that I pulled 
out of the air for my first example. And I took this out and I'm going to show you how to work it out and we'll see if the numbers coincide with what I did the first time. Okay, so in this case, I've got a 10 volt source here, 15 here. There's my 15, my 50, my 25 ohm. What you do in this case <clears throat> is you draw circles and loops, basically. And you label the loop. And what you're saying here is this is a theoretical current. This is I1. Each loop would be labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And they represent the current in that loop. So what we're saying here, you got to understand this. We're saying that there is a current flowing in a clockwise direction, and that current value is I1. Is the current flowing in that direction really? Well, it depends on a lot of things, but uh, it doesn't matter which way the real current's flowing. This is our theoretical current. And over here, I've got another theoretical current called I2. Does that mean that the current's flowing from left to right through that resistor? Not at all. I2 may turn out to be a negative value, and if that is the case, then the current's actually flowing in the opposite direction, the real current. But uh, you'll see this as we go. Now, here's what we do, okay? <clears throat> we use Kirchhoff's series voltage laws for this. And remember, if you start at a point in a circuit, if I start right here, and I count the voltages that I gain or lose going up to here and then do the same thing over to here and then do the same thing down to here and do the same thing coming back over there. When I add all of these voltages together, some of them will be negative and some of them will turn out to be positive. And the deal here is when you add them all together as negatives and positives, you're going to come out at the ending point, which was your starting location with a sum of zero. So when you go all the way around a loop, you come back to zero. Now we don't do this, but if you started here and went around the whole loop, you'd get the same thing. That would be identically the same thing. So anyway, um, in this case, we're gonna use and say this is I1. Well, I1 goes through this, this source here, okay? And uh, if you start here, and we take a trek around this closed path, the first thing we do is we come from negative to positive up through the source and we gain 10 volts. So here's positive 10 volts. I didn't put the positive there, it's understood. Now, I've got I1 flowing through this 15 ohm resistor. So what is my voltage across here? Well, it's gonna be 15 ohms times I1, whatever that is. And we leave the ohms off just for convenience. And we say that the voltage across this is 15 I1. But is it negative or is it positive? Well, we're moving now from left to right. So we're going from positive to negative. And if you remember the rules, that means that our voltage that we have to write down is actually negative. This is like a draw. So that would be negative 15 I. We don't know what I is, but we know that that voltage is 15 times I. Now, I'm going to come down through this resistor right here. Well, this resistor has I1 flowing from top to bottom through it. So I'm going to say that uh, I've got a negative 25, that's 25 ohms here, times I1. And it's negative because I'm going from positive to negative. So that'd be a negative 25 I1. But we can't stop there because here's another deal. We got a current going from bottom to top over here called I2, and it's also going through that resistor, and it will also influence the voltage of this resistor, sort of superposition, if you will. So in that case, I've got this I2, and I have to account for that. So when we're going in our clockwise trek around this circuit, I'm going from negative to positive. So this value is going to be positive, and it's going to be 25 ohms times I2. This is going to be equal to zero. So when you add all of that up, it has to be equal to zero because our ending place is the same place as our starting location. So let's add some of this up. I got a minus 15 here and a minus 25. Both of these are I1 coefficients. So I've got <clears throat> excuse me, negative 40 I1 plus, I got an I2 term, put them in order. 
I've got 25 I2, and then I've got to add the 10 volts here. And when you add all of that up, it's got to be equal to zero. Okay. So we'll call that equation number one. Now I've got to get another equation. So I'm going to start here. It doesn't matter where you start and it doesn't matter which direction you go in. If you go in the opposite direction, everything's going to change the polarity, but it's still going to be in essence equal to zero. But let's, let's start here and do a clockwise loop again. Starting here, I'm going from positive to negative through this 25. So I've got 25i. Okay, well, there it is right there. Negative 25i2. But keep in mind, I've got I1 also going down through this resistor, and it's entering here and exiting here, which makes this end positive and that end negative. So I now have a, I have a positive 25I1. All right, then I've got this resistor up here, which is 50 ohms, and I'm going from positive to negative. That makes that a negative 50I2. The only current flowing through this is the loop current here. This is both, but only the loop current I2 is, is flowing through that. Now, I got to go from positive to negative through the 15 volts and come back to here. <coughs> so I got to add the negative 15 and it all comes out to be zero. Now, cleaning this up a little bit, get my I1 term. I've got it over here, 25 I1. Then I got a minus 25 here and 50. I got minus 75 I2. Uh, and then my minus 15 is equal to zero. So this is equation two. Now, writing these two equations, equation one, equation two, you see that you got terms in I1 and I2, and you have coefficients here, or you have uh, the constants, I should say. Now, we use a technique here called Kramer's rule. If you want to look this up, it's spelled with a C, C-R-A-M-E-R, -E I think, apostrophe, a Kramer's rule. And uh, it has to do with linear algebra, matrix algebra. Maybe you never had matrix algebra, but this is about the only thing we're going to do with linear algebra in here. The book shows you a technique uh, a little bit different than what I normally teach, but they, they talk about using these, these coefficients. They, they talk about using them and creating what's called delta. Now, to do this, these symbols right here are not the matrices symbols. These or symbols for what's called a determinant. We use determinants a lot in these kinds of calculations. Now, this is a two by two matrix, and it has the constant values over here. So what you do is you take the original matrix, minus 40, 25, 25, minus 75, and you multiply this term by this term, and record that, and then you subtract the value of this term times this term. So in other words, you multiply these two, and you multiply those two, and this set of terms, the product of those two, you subtract the product of these two from it. I've done here that here, minus 40 times minus 75, then minus, this is the way you solve for the determinant, uh, then 25 times 25, or 25 squared, now that would be equal, these two equal 3,000 and that equals uh, 625. So the delta value is 2,375. All right, now how do you solve for I1? Well, Kramer's rule says if you want to solve for this variable here, I1, you see you've got two variables and you've got two independent simultaneous equations. So we can do this. If you only had one equation, you've got an indeterminate result. So if I take I1, and I want to solve for that, it's equal to a ratio of a determinant divided by this original determinant, which we, the answer, the value, uh, simply came out to 2,375. So that's the value of delta. So I, now this, now listen very carefully. What I did was I took my original matrices up here, matrix, which is this one here, minus 40, 25, 25, minus 75. And to solve for I1, I replaced this column right here of my matrix with the constants. So I took the minus 10 and 15 and replaced the I1 column. A lot of times textbooks and professors will actually label these and say, this is the I1 column, this is the I2 column. 
So you replace these with the actual constants. Now, minus 10 times minus 75 would be 750. Then we're going to say minus 15 times 25, which is positive 375. So when we subtract this out and then divide it by delta, which is simply the value of the determinant, the original determinant, then that gives us 0.1581 amps. Doing the same thing down here for I2, we take the original, original matrix uh, here and we replace the second column. See, this is your this is your I2 column, this is your I1 column. So you replace this column, the one you want to solve for, with the constants, and you determine that. That would be minus 350. And this would be uh, 2,375. This probably should be a minus here. All right. So anyway, here is your value of I2. So being as it's negative, let's go up here and look at I2. Here's I2. You know what? The current's really flowing from right to left through this. Look at this is a much larger value. So uh, it's going to, well, regardless of the size, this is going to flow current this way, and this one's going to flow current this way. So the current up here is to the right, the current up here is to the left. So the way I drew this, I2, is actually this arrow is against the direction of the real current. But we calculated I2 down here and found out that I2 was indeed negative, which I didn't write down until I just noticed that. But anyway, you've got a negative value, which means that I2, by the direction of the original loop that we drew, it flows against that. So that I2 is a negative value. It simply means that the direction is opposite to the way we drew our loop. Now, for I3, um, I didn't really have to, to do this. Um, I didn't have to do another one of these calculations. What I did is I just said uh, I1 uh, minus I2, or essentially I'm adding these two together because they do sum. This has to do with the direction relative to the loop. But anyway, I came out with 0 0.3054, and notice I checked off both of those as being correct. When I go back to the original, find the original, look here. This was the original way we worked this with superposition. These are the same. That's 0 0.1579, I got 158 here. And uh, anyway, my final current would be uh, 0 0.3052, 0 0.3054, a little bit of rounding error there, but I get the same result. So whether you use superposition or you use mesh loop, hey, it worked out. Voila, look at that. Amazing, huh? Okay. So what are the rules here? Well, you can have circuits. There's some in the book, and I'll probably assign one of these. But some of them actually have four enclosed areas. So you look at the enclosed area. This one has two. But if you had another two down here, maybe you just have three. Okay. But as many as you have, you're going to have to have that many loop currents. Don't worry about the direction of the loop currents. You don't have to make them in the same direction, but it makes things a little easier if you do. So you write equations for every loop. You write them down. Now, if you've got three loops, you got I1, I2, and, and I3 loop, then if that is the case, then what you need to do is you need to do a three by three determinant. By the way, I want to I want to show y'all something. I I don't like doing all this arithmetic. I don't know if y'all have figured that one out yet. But I did find, I did some extensive work this morning on. Uh, I did some extensive work on uh, finding an app. Okay. This one right here, this app right here, uh, it's Matrix Master 2. Let me show you this. Okay. Um, if you come up here, this says solve, solve AXB system. That's what we're doing here. So when I put this in, 
if I put in the correct numbers, now this is once you set up your matrix here, and uh, let me just let me just do that uh, while I'm holding it here. The upper left would be minus uh, 40. The upper right would be 25. The lower left would be 25. And the lower right would be minus 75. Okay, I believe I've got that correct. Now, you don't, you don't put in your, your constants yet. That comes in the next operation. So if I say continue, then I put in my constants. And my constants in order would be minus 10. And the lower one would be 15. Okay. So here are my two constants. Yeah. Right here. And then I would say continue. And it gives me the two values. In other words, this would be my results for I1, and this is I2. Now, compare that to what we've got down here. Okay. Uh, here's my point 0.1579, which is that. And here is my other one, which is a negative, which I didn't put on there, by the way. Uh, it is a negative 0 0.1474 for that. So when you do the math and you look at them and how they add in regards to the direction, you find that the total is 0 0.3054. This is a nice little piece of software. I don't know how much it costs. It's not much. Uh, and it's the only one that I've been able to find that's easy to use. And I do like it. Anyway, uh, the name of that is... Uh, Let's see, Matrix Master. Master Two. I don't know what Matrix Master One was all about. But here's the deal. I I don't care if y'all can use linear algebra to solve these uh, on your own, or if you use a calculator, you're gonna be taking the test at home. Doesn't matter. If you want to get that, uh, you can certainly get it. And I would advise it. I mean, I listen. I'll uh, let me let me share something with you here. When I was in graduate school, I uh, I needed an elective, and I looked over. I was working on my doctorate, and I looked over at uh, an elective in the uh, industrial engineering area, and uh, it was basically deterministic modeling. In other words, how do you model for optimum systems? And it uses a ton of linear algebra. And this guy that I had, he was an Indian. I don't mean American, Native American. He was uh, from India. And I do believe the man was a sadist. Um, I don't even remember his name now, and I wouldn't tell it to you if I did. But anyway, he had some ungodly matrices. They were like six by sixes. And he would not let us use calculator. Not only that, but the matrices were, they were in fractions. So you had to find common denominators. You had to be able to recalculate all this stuff. And it was driving me crazy. It is the only graduate class I ever dropped. I went to my uh, major professor and I told him, I said, I think I'm dropping this thing. I said, this is killing me. And I said, I keep making mistakes. Uh, one mistake and the whole thing doesn't turn out well, and he counts off uh, 60% or something. And I never will forget what my major professor said. He says, uh, he says, well, Gary, he said, they don't really use that. Now, this was electrical engineering, very wise guy. He said, they don't really use that until you're optimizing chicken feed or something. I said, you sold me on the idea. I'm dropping it. Anyway, I dropped it. But I was never so happy to get out of a course in my life. Okay. Um, Let's go back and look at another um, share here. Share here. Okay, now I want to talk to you about a very important concept that deals with sources. Okay. And we've already talked about this, but a little refreshing does not hurt. This is an ideal voltage source. The book shows it this way. 
You can have a diamond for a control source, you know, whatever. But this is a voltage source. In this case, it's 10 volts. Or you can draw it like a battery if you want, and that's 10 volts. Both of these are essentially equivalent uh, in our problems. Now, this is ideal. If you shorted between this terminal and this terminal, you'd have, if it's a perfect short, you'd have an infinite current supply. Same thing over here. You don't do that. You can't do that. That's, that's a, like a singularity. It's like dividing by zero. So over here, you have the real circuit. This is a real circuit. This is a real voltage source. Now, although voltage sources, I've never seen one that had a deliberate resistor added, they all have what's called internal resistance. No matter how big that battery is and how powerful that battery is, how much power that battery can deliver, if you put a heavy load on it, it doesn't matter. It's always going to have an internal resistance. When I was working on my submarine design, I uh, wanted to be able to test the batteries. And to test the batteries, you had to put them under load. So what I did was I actually built a huge array of power resistors. The whole value resistance was 0.01 ohms. Let me say that again, one hundredth of an ohm. And what I did was I put that hundredth of an ohm across the battery and I could measure the amount of voltage drop in the battery. And uh, let me let me back up and correct myself there. Actually, the resistor bank that I generated wasn't 0.01 ohms. That turned out to be roughly the internal resistance of the battery. It was higher than that. So it did drop the voltage of the battery. And I'll show you how we can calculate the internal resistance. But that was actually the internal resistance of the battery, not the, the load that I put on it. But you could do that. You could do that. Anyway, all batteries have internal resistance. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you if you look at a battery, and I didn't, I drew the little dotted line around here to show you that that's the entire battery. I did not do that here, but this resistance here is the internal resistance, R sub I N, of the 10 volt battery. So these two together are the real battery. Now, if you leave the terminals of the battery open, in other words, you don't put a load across them, then there's no current flowing. And if there's no current flowing, you indeed do not have a voltage drop across the internal resistance. So that theoretical voltage that you find inside the battery, that 10 volts, that theoretical voltage is seen over here. Now, another way to look at this would be is if I take my very, very high resistance voltmeter let's say it's 10 million ohms and I put it across here and this is one ohm, how much voltage drop do you think I'm going to have here? Well, one ohm and a million, well, let's say one ohm and 10 million ohms, 10 million one ohms, it's going to afford such a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of an amp that that little bit of current flowing through one ohm is not going to give you a measurable voltage here to mention. So in other words, when I put a voltmeter across here, a good voltmeter, it's going to read whatever the internal voltage is of the battery. If you have a, uh, a set of like lead acid batteries, nominally they say the voltage is 12 volts. But if you have like a golf cart battery, like I originally used in my sub, I had six of them, um, you would wind up uh, having for two batteries in series, that would give you 12 volts because there's six volts each for a golf cart battery. That would give you fully charged about 12.6 something volts, maybe 12.65 volts. When they're discharged, it would be a lot less than that. But what happens is if this voltage right here is supposed to be a 12 volt battery and you wind up putting a voltmeter across it and it says 11.5, that battery is pretty well discharged. You said, well, 11.5 is pretty close to 12. Yes, but this value of internal resistance here goes way up. So when you start trying to draw current from it, you lose a lot of the battery's voltage in here, never gets out of the battery. So if I take a fully charged battery that has one ohm of internal resistance, and I were to put a nine ohm resistor across here, that would give me one amp, and I would have nine volts from here to here, because one amp through nine um, ohms would be nine volts. The other volt would be dropped in here. So the 10 volts inside my battery, only nine of them get out. 
But when that battery is discharged, this might be 10 ohms. In that case, I put that same nine ohm resistor here, I get a tiny fraction of the voltage I would have when it's fully charged. That battery is pretty well spent until you, if it's a secondary cell, you can of course recharge it. Now, here's what we're gonna do. Let's suppose that you've got a battery and you don't know what the internal resistance of that battery is. We don't know this. But we can very easily determine the internal voltage of the battery in this theoretically perfect voltage source that's inside the not so perfect battery. So what we do is we measure it with a reasonable voltmeter. Reasonable voltmeters have very high resistance, so they don't really put a load on this to mention. And I get a, a value called V sub NL. This is the voltage, no load. V and L is no load voltage. That's your open terminal voltage of the battery, okay? Then um, I can put a load on the battery. Let's do that. Now we're taking this same scenario here. I got a one ohm here, 10 ohms there. So I put four ohms here. Now the four ohms is bigger than the internal resistance. But nevertheless, we do put that value here. Uh, it's, it's four times larger than my internal resistance, and that would be a heavy load for this battery, very heavy load. But anyway, I've got RL is equal to four ohms. Now in this case, my total resistance, I have a series circuit, is four ohms and one ohm, which is five ohms. I got 10 volts applied, five ohms, so I've got two amps. So I'm gonna have a flow here and this would be I sub FL full load is equal to two amps. Okay. Now, um, two amps times uh, four ohms here would give me eight volts. Okay. Everybody see that? So I'm going to go from 10 volts open circuited to eight volts if I actually apply this. So that would be V sub FL, that's full load voltage, and that would be eight volts. We can certainly measure that with a voltmeter. Just put a load resistor across it and you get this value. When you take, uh, when you go to a battery location like Red Ball Oxygen or Tri-State Battery in Shreveport, two of the larger battery uh, sellers, at least they were years, several years ago, uh, you go in there with a battery, they can actually test the battery, but they don't bring out a voltmeter to your car and put it across the battery. They bring a device out that has a very low value of resistance here. And they, they basically span it out from one terminal of your battery to the other, put it on here and do a stress test. This is stressing your battery by making it generate a load. So it, it can actually read on a meter if eight volts is acceptable, it may not be, well, it, this is not a car battery here, but they can tell you if the car battery is good or if it is not. Let's look at one other example here. What happens if you just short out between these two terminals? Same battery, just put a short here. What's your, what's your full load voltage there? Zero. What's your current? Well, 10 volts divided by one ohm here, you'd have 10 amps, okay? So this is another way if I can measure this current. By the way, if we put a current meter in here, it's the same thing as a short, right? Because current meters don't have any resistance if they're ideal. So in essence, I could measure this current, okay? And take 10 volts and divide it by the current and that would give me, I'd have 10 amps. So that would give me one ohm of internal resistance. But this is kind of hard on your batteries, okay? You don't really want to do that. I, uh, I used to teach, uh, I used to teach industrial technology. I actually taught electronic engineering technology at Northwestern State. This is back in the eighties. And uh, when I taught down there, I had a guy that used to be in the air force and he told me a story about a fella. Stop this here for a second. He told me this story about a guy that, that, uh, was working with him in the Air Force. He was electronic tech, both of them were. And the guy had a, a Jeep or something, it had a radio in it. He was trying to hook up the radio. And he brought the radio into the Air Force labs. He was not supposed to work on his own personal equipment there, but he brought it in, I guess, kind of after hours. 
and he needed a source of 12 volts. I guess he did not have one. So he um, brought the battery from the Jeep in with him. This is like a car battery. And he left the two leads sort of attached to the battery. So they were not too far apart. And the guy was, this is kind of hard to listen to, but the guy was wearing a wristwatch. And he got that watch, which had a metal band across those two leads. The leads welded themselves to the watch band. And you got a mini, mini ampere load established there. And it actually turned the watch band they said it was almost white hot because of the tremendous power that that was generating. Some of these batteries can generate humongous amounts of power. A car battery, especially a, a like a golf cart battery that's capable of generating probably 1,000, 1,500 amps in some cases, they can generate so much power that they will literally melt a tire tool if you don't try this. It's a lot of power. So you don't want to go and arbitrarily say, hey, I'm going to check the current of my battery. I'm going to short it out. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. So anyway, here's what we do. We take a moderate load, which is what I just went over here with you. We took a four ohm resistor and put it across here. And we have the open uh, voltage, the no load voltage, and we have the full load voltage with RL, the load resistor. Okay, now, I derived this little formula for you last night. This is very easy to use. Um, if you want to find the internal resistance, that's not stamped on the battery, by the way. I never have seen it stamped on a battery. But anyway, Rn is equal to the no load voltage, which is essentially this voltage right here, minus the full load voltage. So when I put this 4 ohm here, I'm calling that full load. And the voltage drops down to 8 volts. So if I've got 10 here in the, in the battery itself, the theoretical battery, and I'm dropping 8 volts out here, how much voltage are we dropping across Rn? Well, the difference. That's going to be 10 minus 8. So the no load voltage minus the full load voltage is the delta voltage or the difference in the voltage that we have across the internal resistance. Then we divide that by the current we get when we got the eight volts out here. And that current is we measure the current or simply measure the voltage across the four ohm resistor, which is eight and divide it by, well, four ohms. And that gives you two amps. So we put the full load current in the denominator. And what we have here is the voltage across the internal resistance divided by the current of the internal resistance. And that turns out to be two volts up here, two amps, that gives me one ohm of internal resistance. Now, keep in mind, you know, I mentioned the fact that RIN is not, absolutely not, a resistor. It is a resistance, very different. You don't put resistors in batteries, never seen that done. But where does that come from? Where does that resistance actually originate? And why is it there? Well, it's a combination of things. It's the resistance of the battery terminals, okay? It is the resistance of the bus bars, that's the metal bars inside the battery that carry the output of the individual battery cells to the terminals. It is the plates of the batteries that comprise the cells, the resistance of those, that gets kind of complex. And it's also, get this, the resistance of the electrolyte. So the electrolyte, current flowing through that electrolyte, heats the electrolyte up, and that manifests itself, of course, as a resistance. Um, so a battery can generate a lot of heat when it's being used. Okay. So this internal resistance here, this internal resistance can be calculated. That's what I was doing when I found out that the internal resistance of my batteries were in the order of 0.01 ohms. Uh, I probably tell too many stories, but you got to hear this one. This pertains to batteries. Uh, years ago, I was working in my sub, and I had six golf cart batteries. Each one of those batteries uh, was capable of delivering six volts at around probably a short amount. You probably got around 1,500 uh, amps 
potentially. Now, you would never, ever want to short one of those batteries out. Oh my God, that would be uh, horrendous. And I was in that sub laying on my back. I had removed the seat and I was down in the hull and I was working overhead like this behind me. And my rear end was right up against the motor control console. And um, anyway, I, uh, I got to thinking, I was laying there on my back and I started thinking about all of those high current cables, these big quad all cables that I have to carry this 175 amps when the motors are running, about 175 maximum at 36 volts. I thought, my God, that would be a horrible thing to have one of these short while I'm scooting around here in this thing on my back. And I scooted down a little farther and all of a sudden, I began to hear something sizzle. And the first thing that went through my mind is, oh my God, I have shorted out this enormous system of power. I've shorted it out. And what I'm hearing is the batteries, it's boiling the electrolyte. Now, this is the first thing that went through my mind. I'm boiling the electrolyte in my batteries. That's the fluid in a lead acid battery. I want to tell you, I've gotten in and out of that submarine probably thousands of times. Never once did I get out of it that fast. I flew out of it. I think I was on my feet outside the sub about 10 feet away, standing up after about two and a half seconds. That's quite a bit of power generation in my own body there. Uh, finally, I went back when I got a little braver, I went back and I kind of leaned my ear over the hatch and I listened inside the sub and I, I didn't hear anything anymore. So I thought, well, maybe a stabilizer. I could just imagine how much baking soda I would have to have to neutralize one of these huge batteries if it split. And I didn't hear anything. I didn't smell anything. I didn't smell anything caustic. I didn't see anything. It looked out of the ordinary. So I eased my way back in there to feel of the battery temperature. It was a can of scrubbing bubbles that I had scooted my rear up against and it pushed up against a, like a bulkhead and it began squirting, scrubbing bubbles. I was a little, well, I shouldn't even tell that story. Okay, that's, that's not a story we really need to hear. All right, now let's go on back up and, uh, and look at something here that pertains very much to what we've been doing. This is actually called uh, source conversion. Remember that I told y'all that there's quite an equivalency, sort of a reciprocity between current and voltage in so many of these circuit considerations. There is an equivalency between what we could look at as a battery with its internal resistance and a constant current source that has a parallel resistance, okay? These two are actually equal, or at least they can be equal. They can be equal. So when we look at this equivalency, what we have here in this case is a voltage source with a series resistance. And I'm gonna call this this is not necessarily the internal resistance of a battery. It could be, as in the previous examples, but RS here is actually series resistance, okay? And um, so anyway, I've got a series resistance and a series voltage source. I can transform this circuit right here into a constant current source and a parallel resistance. This is kind of neat. I can also go from a circuit that looks like this, where you've got a constant current source and a parallel resistance. I can transfer that over into this circuit here that is basically a series voltage resistance circuit. Now, to understand how this works, um, if you look at the terminal voltage across here, in other words, just like we did with the battery a minute ago, you look at V open. And I put a, a meter across here. It's still open because remember, ideal meter has infinite resistance. So this circuit doesn't even see the fact you're measuring its voltage. 
So it's going to see VS. It's not going to see anything to do with RS because there's no current flowing through my meter. There's no current flowing through RS. So the voltage that I measure here will be VS, open circuit, no load. Now, if I were to put a battery, excuse me, put a short across this, in other words, I come out down and over with a wire. In other words, I just literally put a zero resistance load across here, a current meter, or we'll just say a wire. Then what's going to happen is you're going to have a massive amount of current flowing through here. Okay, and how much current would flow? Well, I say massive, it may not be that large. The amount of short circuit current is actually VS divided by RS. It's Ohm's law problem. So if I put a if I were to put a, a, a wire across here and look at the current, and it would be flowing downward, that would be the short circuit current. Now, if it's a battery, you might get a massive amount of current, but this resistance here may be quite large. It might be several thousand ohms or something, in which case the current wouldn't be that great. So the I short would be the voltage that you're applying divided by the series resistance. Okay. Over here, we've got a current meter. What value of current meter do I need to replace this circuit? I want to do this circuit instead of this one. Well, very simply, the amount of parallel current that you need from your current meter, IP, that's the value of current that this constant current source produces, is simply going to be equal to Vs for over here divided by Rs. So, in this case, we could calculate the amount of current that this would have to have and replace it with a current meter. Okay. Now, here's the deal. RP is equal to RS. They're the same value. So this resistor is the same as this resistor. Now, let's say, uh, let's see. Let's see if I have, uh, I don't remember how it works. Any examples of this? Yeah, I did. All right. Let me go over to the next page up here. Okay. Now, I put in some examples here. So this is 2 ohms and 10 volts. So the open circuit voltage is 10 volts measured across here. The 2 ohm doesn't, once again, have any effect. And if I short it out, I'm going to get 5 amps because I've got 10 volts and 2 ohms. So I'll have 5 amps going through my short. So this is what I'm trying to model. Now over here, I want to say that IP, which is essentially what this is, the parallel current source, that is going to be VS divided by RS. In other words, it's actually going to be the short circuit current that you would have here if you just put a wire across that. So I'm going to have 10 divided by 2, which is 5. So I'm going to make this 5 amps. RS is equal to RP. I didn't label this, but this would be RP, the parallel resistance. They are the same. So what happens if I put a short across this? Well, current's flowing out of the 5 amp source, and 5 amps, I might add, of current. Is it going to take the path of zero resistance or is it going to take this path of two ohms? Well, it's actually going to all go through the short. Okay. It's going to all go through the short. None of the current, if I do short this out, like so, none of the current is going to flow down through that line right there. Okay. So, yeah, let me... Let me rephrase it. All of the current of the source is going to flow down through that wire right there. All right. So um, let's look at this. If I short it out, I get five amps. That's what I calculated here. It's going to be all flowing across this. So that would be five amps. Okay. And if I open it up and do an open circuit evaluation on my new configuration, my equivalent configuration, what would I have? Well, here's five amps. It's going to be flowing across two ohms. So five times two is 10. So I'll have 10 volts here if I don't put anything across it. Well, that's exactly what I have over here. 
So this is equivalent to this. Okay. So what if I have this, this circuit, and I want to make it a series circuit? Well, really, it's pretty easy because all I really have to do is to take the current that I have here, multiply by my resistance, and that gives me my voltage over here, take the parallel resistance, make it a series resistance, and now we have an equivalent version of what we have over here. And in a circuit, they behave identically. There's absolutely no difference at all between the two. Okay. Now let's have some fun. Are you tired of looking at this one? I just kept using the same one because I knew if I were making a mathematical error or not, I could uh, verify that I'm getting the same results. Originally, I was going to do an example from the book, and I said, no, I'm going to do the original one that I, I gave you early on today. And uh, sorry for my discontinuity in the circuit right here. But here's what I did. I said I've got 10 volts and 15 ohms. Now, if you want to, if it makes you happy, we can put two terminals across here. And uh, that would be essentially a circuit added to that. So I could take this and turn it into a, uh, a parallel circuit. I could do the same thing over here. In other words, I could take R2 in essence and circle this and I could have 50 ohms here and 15 volts here and make this a constant current source. So let's do that. Now, when I do that, I'm going to have a constant current value right here of 10 volts divided by 15 ohms. So that's going to be 0.667 amps or 667 um, milliamps. So that's my constant current source. Now the battery moves current upward and over. This moves current upward and over. So the direction is the same. All right. But I can't just stop here. I've got to put a parallel resistor. Now the parallel resistor is the same as my series resistor up here. This is basically RP if you want to get technical about it. And this one is RS. I actually had that as R1, but it is in the equivalent circuit, it is RS. All right, now over here, what I did here is I had to replace this, which is trying to move current up and to the left with the constant current source, IP2. And that's 15 volts divided by 50 ohms would be the equivalent constant current source. And that's 0.3 amps, okay? And my series resistance, RS, would be RP down here. Okay, now I put this together. Now I've got two constant current sources basically feeding a super node up here, and I've got the same thing down here. So I've got two nodes. I've got this current going into that node, this current going into that node. So we can take this value of current add this to it, so that becomes 0.967. And here's essentially what I have, 0.9667, I added another place. That would be IP1 and IP2 added together because these are pumping current up into this big node and it's coming back down three ways through those resistors. Now, this resistor that's equivalent resistance, it's not in this configuration, but it's an equivalent resistance. This is in parallel with this, is in parallel with this. Now, that would be 15 ohms, two lines like that's parallel, with 25 ohms in parallel with 50 ohms. And when you do the calculation here, I came out with 7.8947 ohms. By the way, in this, you can say 15 times 25 divided by 40. And take that value and take that value times this divided by this value plus 50. And when you do that, it turns out to be that value. Now, I've got a constant current source, really two of them. But when we combine them together, we look at one constant current source that's producing this much current. We have a total resistance equal to 7.895 ohms. And we're going to say that the voltage across our equivalent resistance is going to be 7.63. Now, how did we get that? Well, what we did is we took this current right here 
and multiplied it by 7.895 ohms. So that gave us a voltage across this. Now, technically, there's no voltage here that we can measure across. This is not going to have the same voltage as the original circuit, nor will this. But this one right here, which is that center resistor in the equivalency, that's R3, it will have VR, that's the voltage across all the resistances here in our equivalent circuit, divided by R3. Now, this is the only one that I really solve for here. But you can see that this value right here, if you remember, that is exactly the value, give or take a little change, that's the value that we had to start with when we did this with superposition. Now this is called, this is called source exchange. We exchange two uh, voltage sources here with equivalent series resistances for two current sources with equivalent parallel resistances. So we actually change the circuit into an equivalency to be able to calculate where we are here. Neato, huh? I liked it. I thought that was pretty good. Let me uh, let me pause this for a second and uh, be right back. Wow, that was a long stay. Actually, I just made a decision as to whether to continue right now. I think I will. Okay, now we have looked at a lot of different circuit theorems here and we've applied a lot of different techniques and one of my favorites and one that you do see repeated uh, throughout electronics is Thevenin's theorem. There's really two reciprocal theorems and I'm going to talk about the other one shortly. It's called Norton's. Now what's interesting is Thevenin you look up a picture of this guy, he was a very dapper young guy. He had a real, the picture I saw, he had a military uniform on, um, very clean cut for, for the 19, uh, excuse me, the 1800s. And uh, he was more or less an engineer and he worked with circuit theorems and, and this type of thing. And he came up with a very, very powerful circuit theorem. And oddly enough, he coincidentally, they, uh, it has the same as his last name uh, as its identifier. So it is Thevenin's theorem. And you spell that, let me show you, do the share up here. Uh, you spell that as T-H-E-V-E-N-I-N apostrophe S, okay? Wow, look, here's that problem again. It's reared its ugly head. <laughs> we're going to solve for R3 in this. Now, we got the same thing that we did over and over. So we can quickly see if we had any uh, math errors. Now, there are a series of steps with this. And as I said, I'm going to copy uh, these sheets and I will make them available to you online. So you can show people how terrible my printing is. And if you want to see my handwriting, it looks a lot worse than this. A lot worse. Okay. Always had. Actually, when I was uh, a kid, I had pretty good handwriting, and uh, that's when you had to learn cursive. And my printing was really good. I don't know. Somewhere in college, it just kind of started to deteriorate. But anyway, um, here's the deal with Thevenin's. There's a set of steps that you follow, and, and it's kind of like a boilerplate approach, and it works. Okay. Once again, this has to be with linear components, kind of like superposition, uh, and resistors are. So what we're going to do is, step one, remove the section of the circuit. Now, notice that I did not say remove R3. That's what we're doing here, but this could be a whole bunch of stuff right here. It doesn't have to be just a one resistor, a single resistor. So in this case, we do have a single resistor. So remove section of circuit in this case, just one resistor, and label A and B. So I put two terminals here where R3 used to be, and I label one A and I label one B. Now, the labeling of the terminals is probably not part of Thevenin's theorem, but it's the way I teach it. So you got two terminals. Now you got an open circuit here. No current could possibly flow through here. You say, well, now how is this going to, this is going to be like that uh, open bridge. Uh, how are you going to calculate anything from that? Well, it's, it's really not, uh, it's not like we're going to leave it open. So here's the deal. 
what do I have here? I've got a 15 volt battery trying to push current to the left through these two resistors, and I got a 10 volt trying to push it to the right. Obviously, this one is going to win. So these two batteries or sources are in series opposing. So how much is the total voltage applied to the circuit? Now, R3, once again, is not in the circuit anymore. You just got two resistors, two voltage sources. So anyway, I've got 15 ohms and 50 ohms. That's 65 ohms. And I've got a total of 15 minus 10 volts. So 15 minus 10 gives me a net of 5 volts. This is 5 volts more than this source. So 5 volts divided by 65 ohms gives me uh, 76.92 uh, mil, uh, excuse me, milliamps. So this would be 0 0.07692 amps. That would be the current flowing in this theoretical circuit if we remove R3. Now, if we take that current and multiply it by 15 here, 15 ohms, it gives us a voltage drop across this resistor right here. Okay. And um, anyway, um, if you add, it's going to be uh, negative and positive because the current's going to be going to the left. So coming out of this uh, battery here and going through that, we're going to have to add this voltage drop to this 10 volts. So when you add them together, uh, it turns out to be 11.154 volts. Now, that would be if you start here at B, follow a trek around, go from negative to positive through the source, I gain positive 10 volts, and then I'm going from negative to positive again, and I gain another 1.154. Adding the 10 to the 1.154, I get 11.154. That is my open terminal voltage across here. So that is the voltage. Um, where do I have it here? Um, well, I didn't put uh, B sub AB, but that's essentially what it is. It's also called, and this is important, this is my Thevenin's voltage. So I designate this voltage. Oh, here it is, B sub AB. And uh, I designate this voltage as the Thevenin's voltage, B sub TH. Now, I've got my Thevenin's voltage. There's one other thing I've got to solve for. In this case, I want to remove all of the voltage and current sources. Now, I have no current sources here. So I'm going to take this voltage source out, and I'm going to take this one out. And just like with superposition, I'm going to replace them. I'm going to replace these with a short. Now, let me take a sidebar here for just a minute. If these are real batteries and you want to be more accurate, it doesn't have to be a battery. It could be a source of voltage. You don't replace it with a short. You replace it with its internal resistance, if you know that. So you've got a battery. It's got a one-ohm internal resistor. Don't replace it with a short. Replace it with a one-ohm resistor. Same thing here. This is all theoretical <clears throat> at this stage, so this doesn't have any internal resistance, so we just replace it with a short. Now, if you've got a current source, you open it, and that goes to infinite resistance. Open current sources, short out, or apply the equivalent series resistance of the source instead of the short. That's a little bit more accurate, but nevertheless. Now, once this is replaced with a short in our circuit here, that's short all source, open all current sources. Then what you do is you, and the expression is used a lot of times with circuit analysis, is you look into ports A and B. Sometimes they will even put a little eyeball here and you look into A and B and say, how much resistance do I see between A and B? So you're looking into the very terminals that you created when you removed originally R3 from the circuit. So if you look at A, what are you really looking at? Well, you're looking at a resistance here. Remember, this is a short here, so you don't count it. It comes back around to B. So the only thing on the right-hand circuit I've got from A to B is 50 ohms. Likewise, the only thing on the left-hand side is this one 15-ohm resistor. So I see 15 ohms between here and here. If I look at those together, then what I see between terminal A and terminal B is 15 and 50 in parallel with each other. Okay, so 15 times 50 divided by 65 turns out to be 11.54 ohms. 
this is our thevenins. This is your R thevenins. This is your thevenins resistance. Now, what have we solved so far? Well, we got our thevenins voltage, which is this voltage right here. And we also now have our thevenins resistance, which is this value. All right. Now, what do you do? You construct a thevenins equivalent circuit. So I'm going to create a Thevenin's equivalent circuit, which has a battery representing the Thevenin's voltage, V sub TH, in this case, 11.154 volts. And the series resistance for this equivalent circuit is the Thevenin's resistance. In this case, it's 11.54 ohms, okay? This right here, and by the way, this is our terminal A and this is our terminal B. I'm going to put back R3. So I'm going to plug R3 back into our Thevenin circuit. Now this out here is not Thevenin circuit, only this. But I'm going to plug this back in just like I'm putting R3 back into our original circuit between A and B. So let me make sure that it's got a good connection here. I'm soldering this now. Okay. Now, once you replace the component, or the circuit. This could be 50 resistors here instead of one, but it also always has to have two terminals attached to those 50 resistors in that hypothetical case. You replace it between A and B, and then you calculate the voltage across R3, that is R3, and you can calculate the current. So how do you do that? Well, very simple. This is a simple, simple circuit. I have a, a source of voltage that's 11.154 volts, and I have a combination of 11.54 and 25, so that would be 36.54 total resistance, and I would divide the 36.54 into 11.15, and that gives me a current of, isn't this amazing, 0 0.3052, which is exactly the same current we calculated when we did the first superposition, and the source replacement or um, yeah source replacement etc if you want to find the voltage here very easy you just take that current multiply by 25 and it gives you the voltage drop across here the rest of it will be in the thevenin's resistance okay so let's go back up here and look at this thevenin circuit in the thevenin circuit up here when we remove that component um this thing has an open terminal voltage. And that's what you would have if you have an infinite resistance, as we said. But the internal, the, the, the series equivalent resistance or the Thevenin's resistance here is sort of a, a measure of the, uh, the give that this circuit has when it supplies current. In other words, if you put a certain resistor here, the lower these resistances are, or the lower the Thevenin's resistance, the less drop in voltage you're going to have here. But if these make an equivalent Thevenin's resistance that's very high, you put a moderate size resistor, you're going to get a very large voltage drop. So that's kind of like representing that Thevenin's resistance is sort of, in a qualitative way, it's sort of representing the give that the circuit has to delivering a voltage to the component that you're replacing here. Okay. Anyway, this is Thevenin's. And um, I think what I'm going to do um, for your next lecture is I'll probably take the Wheatstone bridge and uh, do a Thevenin's on it to show you what the bridge current is. That works so easy um, with Thevenin's and Norton's. And next time we'll also talk about Norton's. And I think with that, I think I've covered all of the, the major theorems that I need to cover with you in this particular area. Okay, so what I'll do then is I'm going to work more problems. So remember, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have on Thursday, if I don't get back to you before Thursday, Thursday night, seven o'clock, uh, if you have specific questions. And by the way, if you have a, if you have a problem you want me to look at, you could email it to me. Uh, one of my students did that. They gave me some problems to kind of look at in preparation for that. So I get a little bit of a, an approach on how to do the problem. 
So if you got a specific question, you might want to email it to me. And I may not work all of these out with all of this detail, but I will I can show you the approach to use and let you work out the numbers of it. Okay. So anyway, um, that's a pretty good size uh, lecture for today. And by the way, I think last week, I think I went 10 minutes over. So uh, I put a big dent today into the uh, weekly lecture um, requirement. Okay, y'all stay safe. And I will see y'all uh, probably on Thursday.